Good morning, everyone. So we are about to begin the session and it's an extremely important session. It's the E-Trade for All Leadership Dialogue, connecting the dots for more inclusive development. So for those who don't know me, my name is Shamika Siriman and I'm the director of the division on technology and logistics of Angtad, where the e-commerce and many other interesting things happen. <laughs> so let me also tell you that this event is broadcast live and the session will be interpreted simultaneously into all UN languages. Our interpreters are there, thank you very much. And, uh, and if time allows, of course, we will also take a few questions from the audience towards the end of the session. So please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A function of the platform. And of course, the, uh, the everybody joining from the room, you know, you can just raise the flag. So at, the, at every e-commerce week, we have a high level session with E-Trade for All leaders. And it is to celebrate the partnership that we have forged and in, in a quite successful partnership. And then also to chart the way forward, you know, to see how we can do more. So I think our DSG will explain more. In 2016, we launched the E-Trade for All partnership to connect the dots, truly to connect the dots, because it was very clear from the beginning that none of us alone could support developing countries to create the enabling environment to thrive in this emerging digital economy. And because it ranges from many elements of uh, enabling environment, it, it's about the support to the ICT connectivity, the skills, the payment system, legal regulatory systems, the logistics, and financing and more. So we figured as a community that none of us can do this alone. So this is why the E-Trade for All a partnership uh, was born. So during the next hour and a half of this leadership dialogue, you will hear from E-Trade for All leaders on lessons learned from this collaborative initiative, and also how to leverage more our collective efforts to leave no one offline and no one behind. So I'm very pleased to note that the leaders from more than 20 E-Trade for All partners, I think we have 31 now, uh, have contributed to this dialogue either by joining live uh, today and uh, or with dedicated video address or through a think piece. And some of you have chosen many options. And please note that they're all uh, available on the event page on the e-commerce week platform, and they will be displayed during this week and beyond. So I just want to thank all of you for your very relevant and substantive contributions. And so finally, before we begin, I want to say a very, very big thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, so now, without much ado, let's hear from our Secretary General, Rebecca Greenspan, uh, on her views to the leaders. Excellency, distinguished it trade for all partners, friends and colleagues, it is my pleasure to welcome you for this high level E-Trade for All leadership dialogue at the e-commerce week 2022. I was looking forward to be able to attend in person and participate in this very important conversation on an initiative that I hold in very high regard. Unfortunately, the international agenda has decided otherwise. And as you start your meeting, I will be on a plane back from New York to Geneva. So let me, however, highlight how proud I am to be leading this unique partnership. It has been delivering on its promise of promoting more inclusive e-commerce since day one and has been actively advocating for increased timely and coordinated and cost-effective support to developing countries for a more inclusive and resilient digital future. The COVID-19 pandemic only made it more relevant. At this E-Trade for All Leadership Dialogue, I am pleased that so many of my fellow leaders 
have been such an active and useful example of how collaboration can inspire digital for development. Development partners, United Nations agencies and commissions, civil society organizations, and other organizations concerned with digital development, all working together towards a common goal. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and for being such great partners. I look forward to further interacting with all of you during the next months and years and wish you very fruitful discussions today. I thank you. Thank you, SG. Let me now invite Ms. Isabel Durant the Deputy Secretary General of ANCA to offer her welcoming remarks and the keynote address. Isabel, you have the floor. Merci, Shamika. Thank you, Shamika. I'm going to speak French, which will allow you to connect. So everyone, excellent, all our partners of the E-Trade for all, friends, colleagues, the team that prepared all of these sessions. I would like to start by thanking our Secretary General, Ms. Greenspan, for this warm welcome she gave us. She was not able to be with us, which is a shame, but I can assure you there will be other opportunities to discuss with her to see how we can better create these synergies and complementarities, which for her, for us, and for me is clearly crucial. So I have the pleasure of sharing a few thoughts with you on the ways in which UNCTAD would like to uh, face the challenges that uh, await us in collaboration with you, the collaborators of E-Trade for All. So let's just look back for a moment. When the initiative E-Trade for All was first born in 2016, this might seem like a century ago now, we were not living in the same world. This was a time when we still had huge hope in multilateralism, we had just set the SDGs to respond to global challenges, and we had great enthusiasm in every mind. And the economic context at the time did not look very rosy. The e-commerce world had been stagnated for a few worlds. The direct foreign flows were fairly unstable. And on average, the perspectives of growth in 2016 did not look very good. However, e-commerce had begun to develop more quickly than expected and was opening up some new little opportunities. But at the time, many governments of developing countries, for many of these governments, it was a great challenge and an unknown challenge. And they were often not well equipped to make use of this new potential. So in this context, E-Trade for All was born. At the time, this was a call for a new model of partnership, strongly anchored in the institutional program of each partner. The aim was not to create a new structure or a new organization or a new, a new body within the United Nations, but rather to work as a network with the 14 founding members in order to face together the new challenges of e-commerce. So where are we now, 2022? Since 2016, we have gone through a period of great change in many ways, in the many dimensions. Of course, there have been commercial tensions, and unfortunately we know this, the multilateralism has been weakened. We are more concerned with climate change and the urgency and the need to respond. We have had a pandemic which led to a health and economic crisis, the greatest in this century. The global economy has started to um, bounce back from the pandemic, but in 2022, we are still moving at two speeds, even if the e-commerce uh, world looks good, it is very unequal, and we can still see the effects of the pandemic, and some are still far more vulnerable to shocks from the outside, such as environmental and what is happening in Ukraine. After decades, the pandemic has allowed us to 
bring back the state as a major actor, as a stakeholder in the economy, as a key uh, mover. And in this pandemic period, this is a lesson that we need to hold on to, because in terms of trade and investment, when all this plummeted in 2020, they have come back up higher than before COVID. With the pandemic, we also saw a huge increase in sales online, a greater dependency on a series of digital tools. This is can be a good thing, but this also has a negative side for those who are excluded from these possibilities. It also offers a great potential. This also leads to great challenges, of course. As the digital economy grows, the traditional digital divide is has a second divide which is added, which is the issue of data, and this is exactly what we what led to this e-commerce because the individuals and the countries that are less well prepared, particularly in least developed countries, where only 27% use the internet, run the risk of falling still further behind on this divide in the use uh, the, of, uh, of data and the commercialization of data. With the war in Ukraine, the challenges of COVID have rather disappeared from the headlines but not in reality, of course. And this conflict, in turn, has had a deep impact on international trade, on food security, on providing energy, on financing, and in a certain way also on cybersecurity. So we will have to work together to face all of these challenges, which will require from all of us and or plural approaches, which are holistic, intersectorial, uh, interinstitutional, and more than ever, each of us needs to move beyond our, our comfort zones, our frameworks, and we need to work on our synergies to avoid uh, duplicating efforts, maximize our impact. We all agree on this. But in order to do this, the UN and the multilateral framework is the natural place for this cooperation. And this is why in the new economic, uh, digital economy based on data, we are very proud to have found an e-trade for all because this is a reference point for all questions related to e-commerce and digital economy in development. The pandemic strengthens still more the importance and the relevance of this e-trade for all initiative. And as Ms. Greenspan was saying, this initiative has also kept its promise of promoting inclusive dialogue on digital economy from the very start. She has also worked hard for uh, cooperation with developing countries for a more inclusive digital economy in future. Our E-Trade for partners are constantly in communication. The institutional partners, the key partners, has now reached 34. This means that the number has more than doubled since 2016. During the pandemic, E-Trade for All partners worked together to raise awareness for opportunities as well as the risks of e-commerce. And we have contributed to identifying ways in which developing countries and least developed countries can overcome these. Bringing together partners and providing these possibilities for more transparent, more cooperative, more efficient cooperation, rather like these open source uh, programs, which we are very attached to. E-Trade for All has also carried out various collective projects together. Ladies and gentlemen, dear partners, dear friends, I'm very pleased to open and to contribute to this important conversation between different leaders of trade for all. And I hope that we can lead to new proposals, methods that may be still more ambitious, more intelligent, or more efficient, more useful to be able to allow all stakeholders to work towards achieving our shared goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you for outlining the challenging context within which developing countries operate right now. I think the multiple crisis is the norm. And how do you operate you know, when the, with this cascading uh, crisis coming your way? So thank you so much for outlining, basically setting the stage and also showing how important are partnerships how, in this moment in time, how important that are us coming together 
to deliver as one. So let me now invite Mr. John Denton, the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce to offer his welcoming remarks. And also want to say, I'm very happy to say that Mr. John Denton joins this leadership dialogue today in his new capacity as private sector representative to the E-Trade for All initiative. So John, we look forward to working with ICC on making the digital economy more inclusive. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, sure. Madam Chair. And it's also great to spend some more time with the leadership group from ICAO. Uh, as I mentioned in the opening session yesterday, I've been privileged to work very closely with Rebecca, uh, not only in her previous uh, role at SEGIB, where she led that organization so effectively, but also uh, in my current participation uh, as the private sector, as the only private sector representative on the United Nations Secretary General's Global Crisis Response Group uh, to the crisis in Ukraine, uh, the way it plays out, particularly in the food, energy and finance sectors. And uh, Rebecca and the team at UNCTAD have been coordinating, I think, some very significant and very helpful observations, interventions, research. And at the moment, what I'm trying to do from the ICC's perspective is ensure we turn those observations, reflections and research into outcomes and processes that can ameliorate the effects of this totally unnecessary crisis caused by this totally illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the way it plays out for developing countries. We need to mitigate that. As many of you would know, the ICC is constituted by more than 170 different uh, ICC and chambers of commerce in more than 170 different countries. More than two thirds of the ICC is comprised of business communities operating in economies in vulnerable communities, in vulnerable countries, vulnerable to economic shock, vulnerable to the potential of a food supply shock, energy shock and finance shock. And we are working as hard as we can with any organization uh, which could actually help those business communities survive. And importantly, I think that the work that uh, UNCTAD's leader, Rebecca, is coordinating for the UN Secretary General in, in many respects in preparation for his extraordinarily urgent mission today to Moscow and then to Kiev uh, is critical to trying to find a pathway out of this totally unnecessary crisis. And of course, when we think about crisis, we also think now very much after the experience of what people now tend to call the multiple layered upon crises of resilience. And when you look at um, what resilience comprises, a lot of it actually comprises in the business sector now about the ability to access and enable uh, opportunities from digitization and digitalization. And of course, that is where this particular initiative that I'm very pleased to participate in at a leadership level on behalf of the, the global private sector with um, the UNCTAD coordinators plays such a critical part. So for us, the issue for us is really the, about the essential role that data now and digital technologies will come to play in our everyday lives. But we actually want to ensure that that is not reserved for the few, but for all. At ICC, we run a campaign which is make technology work for all. At ICC, we run a global campaign to stop the global rise in growth, in, stop the growing rise in global inequality. And we just don't talk about these things, we seek to act to enable action to actually give effect to those campaigns. And we see, frankly, even though there's been such an extraordinary improvement in broadband coverage and actions and actual coverage available. In, digital, in the digital and telecommunications world. The fact that we still have almost 3 billion individuals globally unable to participate is a glaring inequality which must be resolved, which I believe that the private sector led by an organization like the ICC uh, is seeking to resolve and is acting to resolve, which is why initiatives such as that which has been launched by UNCTAD uh, the e-commerce, e e e-trading for all is so important from our perspective. And we see that uh, a way of doing that is through uh, 
quite substantive and real collaboration between the UN, its agencies, between the multilateral development banks, with civil society, with industry associations, uh, and the private sector at the heart of this. I mean, people call this multi-stakeholder. I just call it for what it is. It's basically effective global coll collaboration amongst interested parties. And that's actually not a competition. It's where the parties seek to put their own interests at, or reflect the interests of others at the same level as their own interests, truly collaborating, not just talking about things, which is why it's so important, I think, that um, the ICC is now involved institutionally in global crisis responses put together by the UN, why we actually engage with so many UN agencies to help all these UN agencies understand how true collaboration with the private sector can help resolve some of the some of the growing crises we confront, but also deal with some of these global problems that we confront as well. Can you really think of a global problem that confronts the world that can be solved without the involvement of the private sector? And I think that's true from climate all the way through to access to digitalization and access to the platform we're talking about. Uh, in this discussion today. Uh, there is no doubt that digital connectivity has rapidly become one of the most defining features of our everyday lives. A recent report suggests the digital economy is now worth something like $11.5 trillion globally. And actually it's equivalent to just over 15% now of global GDP, that's extraordinary. And the other sort of data point which is relevant here is that digital economy itself has grown two and a half times faster than global GDP. So what is powering economic growth and therefore opportunity for all is actually the digital economy. And what we want to do is make certain that the whole world participates in that and it's not just reserved for the few. And that's really important from our perspective. As I said, the ICC is representative of so many vulnerable global communities, which need the support of effectively functioning private sectors and effectively pri functioning private sectors with the resilience required to deal with the challenges we confront must have digitization and access to digital tools at the forefront. Uh, we know that uh, information and communications technologies or ICTs are also transforming essential so uh, social services such as education and healthcare. We saw the latter in particular and the former specifically during the worst periods of the pandemic, which as you know, goes on, as well as the ways in which people interact with their governments. This whole issue of ICT enabled governing is really important for us. In recent years, we've seen enormous progress in expanding connectivity. But as I said before, even though we have so much of the world now covered by broadband, the issue is still that we have not enough people who are actually covered and enabled to access and actually actively use the internet. The number I have here is that around 4.9 billion are able to use the internet, but almost 3 billion are still remaining offline. I repeat that number, 3 billion are still offline. Do we really think that that's going to enable inclusive growth? So we really must act on these issues. It's a call, a call, to, act. It's a call to action. The COVID-19 pandemic clearly showed the value of such connectivity. I think uh, all of us would understand that, uh, the way it operates, and enabling people to continue their usual economic and social activities during those lockdowns in 2020 and 2021. And as you know, the intermittent and quite severe lockdowns that continue in parts of the global community right now, that's enabled still uh, economic activity by actually access to the digital plat through platform and through ICT. However, as I repeat again, this lifeline was only available to those who possessed the key ingredients of meaningful connectivity, which is robust infrastructure, relevant digital services, and effective skills. Although there continues to be significant increases in internet adoption, these inequalities persist and will do so unless both coverage and user gaps are actually addressed. For this, dedicated and effective actions are needed on both the supply and demand side, of connectivity throughout the entire digital ecosystem. The functioning of the ecosystem relies on a 
myriad of both voluntary and mandatory interconnection agreements between network infrastructure providers, developers and producers of ICT applications. So as well as initiatives for skilling, expanding a user's ability to not just understand and use technology, but in, or, in order to actually turn that into an ability to create uh, themselves, to create their own opportunities from the digital platform is key. And that's exactly, by the way, what we're looking at and what we're doing at the ICC. One of the interesting features of the ICC I'll share with you is not just the constituency that we represent and how we represent them, but we also operate basically in two triptychs. The first is around the idea of global policy. So that's one reason we participate in these global policy debates. The second, because of who we are, the size, our independence, the fact we're purpose-led, we have an independence ICC form of governance, we have our own courts, we're able to create and enforce standards in areas where governments can't act. But importantly, we actually just do stuff on the ground, we create tools. And we do that at a global, regional and local level. We're looking for impact all the time. And so in order to uh, address this issue of global inequality as it pertains to uh, telecom access, digital access, again, we're not just talking about policy frameworks, we're doing things. We have created centers of entrepreneurship, the sole aim of which is to enable individuals in vulnerable economies to actually create a livelihood for themselves, their families and their communities. And part of that, as you would imagine, is actually providing them with the skills, the access to capabilities for engaging with the digital economy. We now have something like 10. In fact, we've just launched an ICC Center of Entrepreneurship for Ukraine, which is actually aimed specifically in providing those very skills, uh, for, firstly, for the extraordinary refugee community, 80% of whom are women and children, which have been forced outside the borders of Ukraine but also to deploy, which we are deploying right now in Ukraine in order to maintain and preserve the private sector and the economy there. If you like, you can call it the economic front against this unnecessary invasion, this illegal invasion. And it's really important to keep that economy going because ultimately we will want to rebuild the Ukrainian economy, but without having an economy in place, which is characterized by a strong private sector, that'll be so much harder. So we keep that going. And we use that and we're actually using digital tools, digital skills, digital uh, opportunities, which we're providing through the ICC Center of Entrepreneurship. And so that's why what we do is we provide skilling, we expand users' ability to not just understand and use technology, but how to create. That's really important for us. So private sector investment in each of these layers helps drive progress and innovation on both the supply and demand side. The public and private sectors must work as partners in enabling this to happen. I actually think that um, this initiative that we're part of here over the last couple of days uh, in Geneva, um, I wish I was there in person, but I'm actually in Paris today. Uh, but I think this is a really important initiative. And I actually think this is an initiative where we're extremely pleased for the ICC to lend its weight, its independence, the high trust nature with which we're held by so many parts of the global economy because we actually think the fact that we are an open platform, that we are a neutral player, our only aim is to deliver on our purpose, which is enabling business worldwide to secure peace, prosperity and opportunity for all, helps us understand why we are the natural partner for this, uh, for this project. And I'm very happy and I'm very pleased to be able to participate with you today and lend our support and my, my actual personal uh, uh, commitment to ensuring that this is a success. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, as I said, I've had a bit of a lot of engagement with UNCTAD over the last little while, and I continue to enjoy that. And I look forward to more, and I look forward to really engaging on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denton. And uh, I mean, you call for true collaboration with private sector. I think you said it a few times. So we are very happy to have you in the E-Trade for All partnership, and we will count on ICC to lend its weight uh, to the uh, to the program. Thank you so much. So let me now invite Ms. Martha Newton, Deputy Director General for Policy of uh, ILO, International Labor Organization. Secretary General Greenspan, E-Trade for All Partners and Distinguished Participants. As a key partner of the E-Trade for All Initiative, it's my pleasure to participate in e-commerce week 
and say a few words on behalf of the International Labor Organization, the ILO. The ILO Centenary Declaration recognizes technological change as one of the transformative forces in the world of work. Over the past two years, most of us have witnessed the immense potential of technology to help keep businesses afloat, workers safe, and to enable new working modalities. Yet this transformative potential of technology has two sides. On one hand, technology can facilitate trade, job creation, and improve innovation and working conditions. But on the other, technological innovation can make jobs obsolete and may require that workers seek new skills for jobs that are now available due to growing technology. The ILO is researching how technology is transforming the role of workers and employers and the resultant impact on their interactions. When considering digitalization, it's especially important to remember the impact on the smallest enterprises. Although they're often overlooked in debates about technological innovation, micro and small enterprises, MSEs alone, account for 40% of employment worldwide. Yet we still know little about the effect of digitalization on MSEs, whether positive or negative. Micro, small and informal businesses are among those that have been hardest hit over the last two years by the pandemic. Limited access to digitalization has exacerbated the challenges associated with the pandemic, as many SMEs have been unable to swiftly move to online marketplaces or remote work modalities. ILO's Small Goes Digital Report is one of the first comprehensive reviews of evidence on the state of digitalization of micro and small enterprises around the world. Small and informal businesses do not digitalize automatically and have so far been largely been excluded from the digital revolution. And there's urgent knowledge gap concerning such enterprises. Specifically, their ability to use digital technologies to increase productivity and in trade, improve working conditions, and grow sustainably. The linkages between digitalization and decent work in particular are not well known, and more research is needed to understand these linkages. And this is a big task. We call on E-Trade for All partners to team up and jointly address key challenges that our micro and small businesses are facing when it comes to digitalization, productivity, trade, and decent work. We at the ILO are committed to working together with you to ensure that no one is left behind. I wish you all a successful e-commerce week. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Newton. And just also want to acknowledge that the work of ILO has done on state of digitalization of MSMEs have been used widely by the E-Trade for All partnership as we deliver on the ground. Thank you so much. So let me now move to the next segment of our conversation and it's called the setting the scene. So we have uh, three speakers. We have uh, Mr. Yuan. Kubralia, he's the executive director of the Diplo Foundation, and uh, Mr. Ratnakar Adhikari, executive secretary of the Enhanced Integrated Framework, EIF. And then we will also hear from uh, Mr. Andrew Solomon, he's the president and the CEO of Internet Society. So, Johan, I'm going to start with you because it's, uh, you know, you always, we always throw you very difficult questions. So, I think you have heard from uh, many speakers now the main challenges developing countries are currently facing in this current global context. So how would these multiple shocks affect the ability to embrace the digital transformation effectively and achieve a more inclusive digital economy? And what can be done collectively uh, to, add, you know, to alleviate the difficulties that the developing countries are facing at this moment? Johan, I will start with you and, uh, and then we will go to the other speakers. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Shamanko. It's great to be again at uh, your discussion. Sorry, it's not COVID. I'm adjusting 
have some sort of respiratory allergy. And uh, it's also in that context, Zoom uh, meetings are more efficient that people are not worried about me spreading viruses. Uh, uh, that's great to be uh, again uh, today at the, at the session. And uh, when, you, when you ask me what developing countries can do uh, and what, what could, how we can set the stage is uh, first of all, uh, to uh, try to uh, preserve what can be preserved from multilateralism. Two days ago, we celebrated the day of multilateralism, but it wasn't day for celebration for the reasons that were listed and we are all aware of mainly related to Ukraine war. The question is that the developing countries uh, would be the biggest losers of the power politics in every field, in politics, security, and what is important, what we are discussing in e-commerce and uh, digital commerce. Therefore, all attempts to preserve international law, to preserve some rules of the game, are of the vital importance for the uh, all small countries, but in particular, uh, particularly developing countries. Therefore, this is the first first notion. Uh, it won't be easy. It is uphill uh, battle. There are a lot of skepticism about uh, international law, international order, and uh, as we are sitting in Geneva and discussing it, it is the place where it uh, has to be um, somehow supported, uh, restored, and promoted. But not for any, I would, I can call it naive views of. Uh, of uh, saying uh, good things and uh, having a good rhetoric, but for very practical issues. The big countries can do whatever they want. They have a power, but small countries have international law and the rules of the game as only way to protect themselves. How does it refer to uh, e-commerce and all of this set of issues? This field uh, is uh, uh, in between traditional regulation of the trade and commercial issues and uh, new rules that are established, especially around data and artificial intelligence. Old rules uh, are something that we have. I'm speaking about WTO, regional trade agreements and, and other, other rules, and we should, uh, we should build on that. We should, I think in time of crisis, like on national level, countries, um, dig out constitution. And this is a, some sort of safety belt very, which you use when there is a crisis. Uh, we should uh, then use all available instruments and documents. That's the first, first point. Second point is the small and developing countries have really to see what is in it for them when they negotiate uh, data and commercial, uh, data and e-commerce issues. We are beyond the point of just rhetorics. We have to see how we are going to benefit. For example, UNCTAD studies are an excellent input for uh, evidence and informed decision-making. Political elites and decision-makers worldwide in both small and big countries have to make decisions. Today, it's technically possible to, let's say, stop data traffic or something like this. But we have to make trade-offs. What does it mean practically for economy and well-being of our citizens? What is the trade-off between security of data and, uh, and the development of local economy versus participating in global economy? Uh, there are no uh, a sort of fixed solution for it. All of these issues have to be revisited with really clarity of thinking, clarity of data, and clarity about consequences of decisions that we have to make. That's the second point. And uh, here I'm a bit worried because developing countries, with exception of few places like, uh, like UNCTAD, are not yet there in the substantive negotiations. In the sense that they are not just physically present, but they can relate what is negotiation, negotiated internationally to their direct concerns, economic, social, political, cultural, all of these, these issues. This is not happening now. And here, my organization, together with, uh, with CATS International, uh, with the ITC, with UNCTAD and other players are trying to do, to develop this skill set that uh, uh, we can have not only formally inclusive, but substantively inclusive negotiation. And third point in that setting the scene is that uh, we are discussing digital issues 
in silos like many other previous policy issues. It is not sustainable, not because of just notion of connecting the dots, looking behind silos, which could be nice, nice point to make, but simply digitalization is crossing the uh, different policy fields. And uh, data, is, data is a standardization issue. It's e-commerce issue. It's a, a human rights via privacy. It's security today. And you can go on and on. It's health and the, the other issues. You cannot discuss just data as a standardization issue without understanding human rights, privacy consequences or development consequences. And this is going to be the major challenge how to develop new type of uh, skills and nurture new type of negotiators who can move beyond uh, silos. Therefore, it is a, my strong call for especially younger professionals, students, to invest their time and energy to become boundary spanners, to go to talk to the Ministry of Finance, Commerce, and uh, Human Rights. And we have some successes like M-Pesa in Kenya, which was basically that regulators from telecom, financial, and, uh, uh, and the competition uh, regulator authorities talked to each other. And they said, okay, let's let it experiment this uh, M-PESA initiative. Therefore, we need more of that open-mindedness, looking beyond the policies as uh, borders of silos, trying to see what is next door. Next door, it is literally in the missions in Geneva, in the ministries back home, in international organizations. Therefore, those are three, three points. Decisive moment, let us rely on the international law as much as it can. This is the only that we have, especially from small and developing countries. Second point, let us, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, let us uh, uh, prepare uh, and help people to have substantive inclusive participation, not just formal. It is the crucial. And it is understanding how the global arrangements are affecting their economy directly. And third point, especially for young officials who are at the beginning of the uh, career, become the boundary spanners between commerce, trade, data, security, and other fields. This is going to be the critical skill set for the future uh, professional life. And I can tell you from really in-depth studies that we have been doing at Diplo in preparation for our courses, which are, by the way, exactly fo focusing on this boundary spanner aspect. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Johan. As I said, I think it's always good to start with you when we have a real big problem. So thank you for these three points. And I especially note, and because it's very close to my heart, because at time of crisis, you said protecting multilateral spaces is key. At the UN, for example, everyone has a seat at the table. And this is, a, this is an extremely important message that we need to, you know, not to forget. Let me now go to Mr. Ratnakar Adhikari and ask his opinion on these challenging times. And, you know, Ratnakar, you're also very much in every speech you do, you also talk about silos and how to break silos. And I think Yuan has this phrase, boundary spanners. I even wrote it down. Yuan, I'm going to say it everywhere from now on. Ratnikar, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonika, and good afternoon, everybody. And very pleased to join this event. Um, uh, let me start off from where Ivan left, actually, left off. He mentioned about the fact that we have to move beyond rhetorics, right? Look at the stark reality that we have. Uh, essentially, I'll be focusing on our intervention uh, in the least developed countries. And the stark reality is that despite significant progress, the promises of connectivity remains unfulfilled for the LDCs. Only two LDCs, Bhutan and Bangladesh have met target 9.6 of the sustainable development goals related to universality and affordability, a target that all the LDCs were supposed to have reached by 2020. Um, this is the report uh, of ITU and UN of 2021, which also goes on to say that several other LDCs are aging closer and will likely meet the target by 2025, but 26 
more than half of all LDCs remain far off. Enabling these LDCs to meet the target, even by the end uh, date of Agenda 2030, is a daunting task. However, by working together um, and breaking the silos, um, if I may um, borrow what you mentioned just now and what uh, you one also mentioned, and connecting the dots, I think we can do it. I would like to list six main dots here. The first dot that is important is the analytical dot. And uh, this is what the E-Trade Readiness Assessment um, uh, does. And UNCTAD has conducted so far 30 E-Trade Readiness Assessment of which 26 are in LDCs or recently graduated countries. And nine of them were supported by the EIF. And EIF is currently supporting the assessment of digital readiness in two um, other LDCs. For those LDCs that are not participating in the E-Trade Readiness Assessment as yet, we have another analytical tool which is known as Diagnostic Trade Integration Study. This also includes a chapter on e-commerce e or digital trade, which comes handy you know, for those countries which do not have access to E-Trade Readiness tool. I'll give you an example of South Sudan, where we are currently undertaking the DTIS, and I checked the other day that South Sudan has not so far um, done its uh, E-Trade Readiness Assessment, and the DTIS itself can um, provide a certain roadmap for the, um, for the country. The second dot that I would like to highlight is the dot relating to policy, strategy, uh, uh, and, 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 and even legislation. Um, this is important because uh, policy, strategy, legislation are the documents that are going to underpin government's strategy over a kind of a medium term horizon or even a long term horizon on what the government would like to do and how the resources are going to be allocated. And in the case of some strategies, I have even seen that they include, they include targets, indicators, and milestones on how they would like to achieve the roadmap. So uh, we, uh, we as EIF are proud to have supported uh, these kind of strategy or um, policy making processes in five LDCs so far, including Bhutan, Cambodia, Nepal, Rwanda, and Senegal. The third dot that I would like to highlight is uh, the one relates that relates to skills. Skill is important, you know, generally important, but you know, particularly for those segments of the society who are excluded from, from, mainstream, mainstream, from the mainstream, including women entrepreneurs, for example, uh, small and micro uh, level enterprises. So these are the kind of you know, sectors or uh, you know, people who need to be supported. And uh, I provided yesterday the example of, of uh, an initiative in South Asia that we have been supporting for the last two and a half years together with the UNHCR to uh, impart skills to 1,500 women of which one third have already joined e-commerce platform created by the project. And we are also supporting a similar initiative um, in Burundi, Ethiopia and Haiti in partnership with uh, uh, ITU um, uh, equal program. Then the fourth dot that is important is the infrastructure related dot. Where, where it is important to help these LDCs uh, to even create uh, the kind of e-commerce platform that is necessary for them to take advantage of the opportunity. And we've supported such creation of platform in countries such as Cambodia, Senegal, and, uh, and Nepal. But uh, what is necessary is that for infrastructure, such as hardcore infrastructure, you know, including undersea cable uh, or uh, electricity uh, generation facility, uh, these countries will continue to rely on the multilateral development bank, some of which uh, also are partners in the E-Trade for all the initiative. Uh, the fifth dot that I would like to highlight is the leveraging dot. The, resource even if the eif and other many other um, you know agencies provide catalytic resources that should be utilized effectively to leverage additional resources and i presented the example of cambodia yesterday where cambodia was able to 
mobilize co funding from Australia and UNDP, I now have as leverage resources from Swiss Connect um, as well, Swiss Contact as well. Uh, and similarly, another example I was discussing with Pamela this morning that uh, we are partnering with ITC uh, to implement a program to digit for the digitization of horticulture sector so that the women farmers and entrepreneurs can take advantage of this opportunity in the Gambia. So this is where ITC um, has uh, provided additional resources and also leverage additional resources. And the sixth dot that I would like to highlight here is the dot relating to scaling up. Um, and this is where I provided the example yesterday and I want to, uh, 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 no, I didn't provide this example yesterday, and I just want to highlight the example of the um, South Asia project we are, where we are supporting women entrepreneurs. We are supporting only LDCs in the region, but then in countries such as India, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Pakistan, and Maldives also offer tremendous opportunities, and that's why we decided to partner with the UNSCAP, and they have promised to mobilize additional resources to scale up the intervention. So they have recently partnered with Commonwealth Secretariat to bring on board other countries uh, you know, to fully support them as well as to scale up the initiative. So these are the six types of dots where I mentioned, um, you know, in my intervention where we partner with various uh, other uh, partner institutions, uh, which are a part of uh, the E-Trade for Inist uh, All Initiative to help LDCs to take advantage of these uh, digital opportunities and in the future to be able to build back better. Um, and I'll, I can come back to, uh, to you with a few examples later uh, in relation to that. I stop here in the interest of time. Thank you, Ratnakar. Thank you for bringing these concrete examples of where the dots are connected. And this is very important. I think we need to constantly talk about these achievements. And also, I want to thank EIF. EIF has not just been with us doing the E-Trade Readiness Assessment, and then you have actively taken part in implementation of the E-Trade Readiness Assessment. So I think, you know, these are things that we need to acknowledge and celebrate. So let me now, uh, in this segment, our final speaker is Andrew Solomon. He's the president and the CEO of ISOC, Internet Society. So you have the floor. Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues. I'm Andrew Sullivan, president and CEO of the Internet Society. And I want to thank you for inviting me to speak here at e-commerce week. Tools that can support human development will only help if people can actually use them. Those without access are twice deprived because they not only miss out on the tools to address present challenges, but they also miss out on the very tool that can help make their future brighter. Now, since we have known all this for some time, it is bitterly ironic that we see today so much effort being spent on making access worse. This happens at multiple levels. Various sanction regimes impede interconnections to sanctioned countries and economies and consequently to their populations. Just as troubling, governments adopt or maintain regulations that make interconnections more difficult or more expensive. That means we sacrifice the surest way we know to improve development supporting infrastructure, the interests of current incumbents and current controls. Attempts to control data flows, whether in the name of sovereignty, citizen protection or commercial advantage are imposed in ways that make the internet more fragile while making permanent the advantages enjoyed by large incumbents. The reason for this irony is that we have forgotten if ever we knew the paradoxical strength of the internet. Because it is a network of networks, it is technically robust. Each network is independent, designed to solve the technical problems that the particular network operator faces. Each network that connects to the internet adds more to the internet's strength, exactly because of the diversity of interests, goals, and design purposes of each network. But this technical robustness comes at a price Everyone participating needs to be able to depend on certain critical properties that enable the internet to work. We need an accessible infrastructure with a common protocol. We need an open architecture of interoperable and reusable building blocks. We need a decentralized management 
and a single distributed routing system. We need common global identifiers, and we need a technology neutral general purpose network. An open internet needs easy and unrestricted access without restrictions on use and deployment of internet technologies, but with collaborative development and governance. A globally connected internet needs unrestricted reachability and available capacity. A secure internet needs strong guarantees of confidentiality and integrity for the information, devices, applications, and services found on the internet. And a trustworthy internet requires reliability, resilience, availability, accountability, and privacy. These basic strategies, which the Internet Society calls the Internet way of networking, are the ones that have given us the Internet. But erosion of them is also what could allow us to lose the Internet. If we adopt laws, regulations, or business practices that tend to erode these critical properties or the enablers of the Internet, we will not merely lose a little bit of functionality. The shadow of SplinterNet is not that we wind up with a few networks that are operated according to national or regional, cultural, and political control. Instead, SplinterNet is the prospect of various online services separated by geography or some other classification that do not connect reliably with one another at all. The prospects for economic and social development in such cases are much worse. We would give up exactly the benefits of the internet that COVID-19 highlighted so dramatically. And that is why it is vital we must keep the internet way of networking in mind in order to achieve data and digitalization for development. Prospects for human development are better with the internet than without it. Governance strategies must always be embraced after careful assessment of the impact on the internet. If we do not beat back the drift towards splinter nets, we will not have data for development but self-imposed disaster. That is why we must keep working to ensure that the open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy internet is for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for highlighting this very important point of having a open, secure, and trustworthy internet. And I think in, throughout these discussions, we are also hearing the importance of the data flows, the data sharing, the data governance issues, and how they need to be inclusive. I think it's a theme that goes through the whole, whole, whole e-commerce week. And I hope to pick up some of these elements in our intergovernmental expert meeting that begins tomorrow. So now I'm going to move to the panel discussion uh, st stage. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you, Ms. Dashti for patiently waiting and I, you know, but anyway, it's an extremely insightful and interesting discussion that we are having. So let me also throw some, a very difficult question to you two, <laughs> to all of you. So we will have uh, Ms. Pamela Cork Hamilton, Executive Director of the ITC and uh, Ms. Rola Dashti, and she's the Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESQUA our sister agency. And we will also hear from uh, Mr. Marhan Oswald. He's the Deputy Director General of the UPU, Universal Postal Union. Uh, and Ms. Anna Jubin Brett. She's the Secretary of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNCITRA. So, the, so sorry for throwing these big questions at you randomly, but Tell me, how are UN organizations and E-Trade for All Partners getting fit for purpose to help countries to address these enormous challenges highlighted by the speakers before you? And how can we leave no one behind? I think this is the, this is the real question we have in this room. And it's the fear that there are many peoples and continents and countries who will be left behind in this digital technological revolution. How do we make sure that it doesn't happen? And what more can we do to make our E-Trade for All partnership stronger and deliver more effectively? So I, as I said, these are the billion dollar questions in front of you. So Pam, let me start with you. Thank you so much, Anika. It's, it's really good to be back here. Uh, many thanks 
to be part of this panel, particularly in person. It's good to see people and touch real people again. <laughs> it's quite a privilege and we never thought we'd ever say that, right? Um, but also I wanna congratulate Shamika and Torbjorn and the team for continuing to pull together this incredible week of activities and raising the awareness and putting this issue on the global stage. It, it has been an incredible um, road to walk and I think that it has been one that has brought and highlighted the issues that need to be done. Now to get to the question, let me start by stating the blindingly obvious. Our entire notion of what digital connectivity means and why it matters has been completely transformed by COVID. I was on a panel uh, in uh, Davos last January and the head of Horizon said that what has occurred in the last year and a half at that time, last year, had catapulted digital connectivity and its necessity by about 10 years. They had not anticipated how much it would be impacted. So recognizing that, and it's not just about what connectivity means to our day-to-day -day working and our social lives, but what it means to access markets, especially if you're a small business, and particularly so if you're based in a developing country, and might I add, even doubly so for a small island developing state like the one I come from. So we've known for nearly a decade that a relationship actually exists between improvements in digital connectivity and economic growth. The truth of that and its inverse became even more apparent during the pandemic. The good news was that both connectivity and participation in online activities took a quantum leap in the last two years. But let's not hide our heads in the sand and continue to fool ourselves. There's still a very unequal digital world. The digital divide is all too real. Across so many countries, and I believe uh, John Denton from the ICC referred to 3 billion people still unconnected. That's half the world's population and probably in the poorest countries. The ability to get online in so many countries, and even if you are online, the ability to harness that access for a better life is still very uneven. Urban and educated populations favored over excluded populations in the periphery, in rural areas, among women, youth, and populations at risk. And given what is happening now in Ukraine and the rising crisis of, of migration and refugees, I think it is something that we also need to address in the context of internally and externally displaced people. So this inequality is also way too apparent in the business world, especially when it comes to large versus small businesses. According to the ITU, as many as 50% of all MSMEs are not connected to the internet which is really surprising in this world where smartphones have done so much to democratize online access. So this has led me to a particular crusade, a call for action, if you will, to get myself and my staff to really respond to this new reality of SME internationalization. And it's why we're here today as part of this uh, E-Trade for All initiative and this e-commerce week. It's important to make it not just the responsibility of some large corporation or government, but also a UN and WTO agency like my own has to take part in this initiative to really make digital trade work for the SDGs. So late last year, I did two things. First, I put digital trade at the heart of our new strategic plan for the next five years. Secondly, I got our digital leads together to ask them what an ITC moonshot for digital trade and connectivity would look like. They came back with an initiative that we had baptized Switch On, and hopefully we'll be able to talk about it next year or before. <laughs> and notice that the letters ITC are in the middle. This underscores our vision of a future for trade, which is almost entirely digital and with a right to participate that is universal. I'm very clear that ITC's lane is not to lay undersea cables, radio mass, or enter into the specifics of telecommunications the so-called first and middle mile of connectivity. But after careful study, we're certain that we do have an important role to play in the last mile, where innovation and entrepreneurship takes place in digital services and access becomes essential. As just one of many examples that we're delivering, we have coached a digital ride hailing service in Uganda, which also provides smartphone financing. 
We've helped this company and similar firms to improve their business models, seek investors, and expand their business to new territories and market segments. We also have a well-established niche in helping SMEs reach global platforms. We work with the community of small e-commerce merchants and the nascent local marketplaces that provide a growing opportunity to serve local and regional markets. We have set ourselves a new level of ambition with the Switch On initiative. Through this moonshot, ITC will ensure that dozens of countries' institutions adopt policies which address the MSME connectivity gap. It will help tens of thousands of MSMEs to connect to new opportunities, ultimately impacting the lives of hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs and their families. And at this juncture, I also want to point out our engagement with the ICC and their Centers for Entrepreneurship and leveraging, as Ratnakar spoke about, leveraging is very important among organizations who are working in this field. The more we work together, the more effective we are and the wider the impact. Also, our work, of course, with E-Trade Readiness Assessments and OMTAD. Like the original moonshot, we're doing this not because it's easy, but because precisely because it is hard. We realize that we will need to retool some of our own processes and priorities, and perhaps more essentially, work with non-traditional partners in innovative ways. So I fully intend for ITC to walk the talk. Otherwise, we'd be just doing our beneficiaries a grave disservice. Digital trade is the future of SMEs going global, and we have to respond, and we will. So many thanks, and I'm excited to be working with so many great partners on this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for taking us through how you have created the space for internationalization of MSMEs, and congratulations uh, for this big initiative, Switch On. And, uh, and also thank you for sharing how have you connected dots and you said not just the traditional partners, but also non-traditional partners. And thank you for this uh, very, very important point. So now maybe in, uh, let me turn to Ms. Dashti, Executive Secretary of ESCO. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let me first uh, like to take this opportunity to congratulate UNCTAD on the success of the Trade for All initiative and reconfirm ASQA's commitment to the initiative as an active member. I come from, uh, we serve the, ASQA serves the Arab region. And let me start by highlighting that the pace of digitization has varied among Arab states resulting in countries with advanced digital maturity, while others are developing and some are lagging. ASCO is working with Arab states to address the digitization and digital challenges in order to bridge the gap so no country is left behind. To connect the dots, ASCO has developed ASCO Arab States Action Program on advancing digital cooperation and development to support governments produce policy measures. ESCO has also helped several countries develop their national digital development agendas and strategies and provided policy advice, innovative knowledge products, advocacy, and capacity building. In cooperation with UNCTAD, ESCO established the e-registration project to help Arab states that are developing or lacking in digital maturity to increase economic formalization, improve administration performance, and grow tax revenues and social, social security coverage. And most importantly, to encourage SME creation and advance women economic inclusion. At the regional level, ESCO is working on developing the Arab digital agenda with the League of Arab States and digital authorities in the region, setting a vision common targets, and joint policy actions at the strategic level. We are also convening all regional stakeholders through our Arab International Digital Cooperation and Development Forum initiative. For the SMEs, and particularly with regards to digital economy and e-commerce, ASQA believes of the importance to support local business communities to survive the competition coming through e-commerce and benefit from the opportunities it provides. 
We partnered with the International Chamber of Commerce and have built the ICC ESCO Center of Entrepreneurship, where we have launched the e-commerce acceleration program, which contributes to the growth of the digital economy and stimulates a dynamic entrepreneurship environment across the Arab region. ESCO in collaboration with ITC, as just Pamela was stating, are building the capacity of 100 Arab SMEs in their transition journey into digital trade, either by building their transactional e-commerce websites or by listing on existing online marketplace. Our aim on this initiative is to reach 5 million SMEs to be digitized by 2030. Furthermore, ESCO in partnership with UNIDO will be convening annually the Arab SMEs Summit. The first will be in Jordan by end of October 2022. The summit aims to help Arab SMEs to access regional and international markets, approach diverse financial resources, benefit from regional and international networks, and increase their ability to scale up and benefit from digital and virtual space. To end, ESCO will continue its commitment and efforts to support member states to address digital challenges, to benefit from the fourth and fifth industrial revolution, and to navigate successfully the digital development transition towards increased prosperity and dignified lives for citizens of the Arab region, so no one is left offline and no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lola. Thank you very much for uh, showcasing some of the great initiatives that ESCO has undertaken, and also in collaboration with ITC and UNCTAD and UNIDO and other partners. I think this is what we want to hear in this uh, uh, forum. So let me now turn to Mr. Marhan Oswald, He's the Deputy Director General of the Universal Postal Union, UPU. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure for me to attend this high level dialogue towards data and digitalization for development. UPU in E-Trade for All as the United Nations Specialized Agency in Charge of Postal Services. The Universal Postal Union has been part of the E-Trade for All initiative since its inception in 2016 as a founding partner. E-Trade for All creates opportunities for the UPU and others to work in a dynamic partnership to achieve far more than they could on their own. Whether in cross-border e-commerce, in last mile delivery, digital payments and virtual marketplaces or in e-trade facilitation. The postal network's contribution is critical to driving forward to e-trade for all implementation agenda and ensuring no one is left behind. This is why the UPU is a regular contributor to the rapid e-trade readiness assessment reports. All in all, the UPU has co-written and co-published two reports, one for Iraq and one for Ivory Coast in addition to regular contributions to over 20 reports for others LCDs and DCs. UPU and the Postal Network, the Universal Postal Union, is committed to supporting member states in the digital transformation and diversification of postal services to bind nations and continents and drive inclusive growth. With over 650,000 postal outlets covering most of the world, and a workforce of over 5 million people. The Global Postal Network, it's a unique asset to support government policies for e-commerce inclusion and development. Posts provide a unique service and delivery network to support the inclusion of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, enabling them to sell online, move their goods across borders, regardless of where they are located. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the inclusiveness offered by postal networks. During the pandemic, posts across the world have been essential service provider, delivering vital health services, medicines, and public pension services to all those in need. The pandemic has also left its mark on the growth in demand in e-commerce. This will certainly be in the new reality in the post-COVID world for everybody everywhere. A regulatory influence on advanced data exchange in the supply chain, 
The COVID-19 pandemic is only one of several elements currently impacting the growth of cross-border e-commerce. Over the past few years, there has been a huge change in the regulatory landscape for the movement of low value parcels and packets across borders, with enhanced focus on security and safety of the increased need for data exchange. Electronic notification of sending the postal items is now critical in meeting legal requirements taking effect in the United States and the European Union and other countries. Upcoming security requirements include making data available before an item leaves the country of origin, confirming the correct export processing to destination customs and transport airlines, and sending security alerts back to the country of origin. The UPU responds to regulatory changes. The UPU has an extensive technical assistance project in place in the most countries to accelerate the digitalization of compliance data for the movement of postal items, enabling paperless cross-border trade to be available for all segments of the population, especially for small and medium enterprises. The UPU has made available millions of dollars in development assistance and works with donors and partners in E-Trade for All to implement these efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marhan. I know that UPU and the post offices have been handling a tsunami of small parcels coming their way. And honestly, and I think it had been a real struggle for the post offices. This has not been their business model. And I know you're working very closely with our ASICUDA program to basically automate and to introduce risk assessment systems into the post uh, offices. And I think this is a great service and thank you so much uh, for being with us. Let me now go to the last speaker of this segment, Ms. Anna Jubin-Brett, the secretary of the UNCITRA. Uh, participants and dear colleagues. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to take part in this uh, event and I'm great, uh, greatly honored to be able to contribute to uh, Ansetral's work in uh, the digital trade revolution that has been discussed uh, earlier by my co-panelists. Uh, we have carried out our digital revolution uh, within Ancitral in moving from e-commerce uh, model laws and international conventions to facilitate e-commerce into instruments to uh, facilitate and to ensure um, to ensure that um, the um, trade and transactions can take place in the digital world. And I would like to uh, highlight here and to illustrate uh, Ancitra's contribution to uh, connecting the dots, particularly in the area of uh, data transactions and artificial intelligence, which are two areas that have uh, been illustrated by one of my co-panelists, uh, Joan Kubalicja, who highlighted that there is a need for new rules on data and artificial intelligence if developing countries want to be in a position to negotiate on data and digital cooperation in a meaningful and fair manner. Uh, and what is really needed in this, uh, um, in this connection is uh, to have a solid legal infrastructure in place to be able to build on it for uh, negotiations that uh, will, of course, impact the way uh, the uh, legal certainty for data transactions and artificial intelligence contracts um, is, uh, is taking place. So what are we doing in a very concrete uh, manner? First of all, we are bringing to this year's commission session, which takes place in New York, we're taking our um, model law on uh, ident uh, digital identity management and trust services. Uh, which is going to uh, ensure that there is interoperability, interconnectability of various uh, digital identities that are conferred either by governments or by the private sector uh, or by platforms, and uh, to ensure that this identity, which is really foundational 
to be able to access uh, trade uh, in the digital world um, is confirmed and is um, is perfectly um, understood and uh, can can uh, interoperate. The second um, contribution we are making is uh, with the new work we have uh, embarked upon uh, in the area of uh, data transactions and artificial intelligence contracting. We uh, are also here working on the legal infrastructure that will enable, uh, will give legal security to and certainty to data transactions and uh, tackle issues such as uh, the, if, if you think about it, there is still, uh, first of all, there's still no uh, harmonized framework or even uh, legal framework identifying uh, what, uh, what is the nature of data, uh, who owns the data, who, how um, data can be uh, transferred, uh, what are the obligations of data generators, of data processors, what are liability issues, and of course, new um, new topics that um, come up because of the very nature of data or artificial intelligence, issues such as transparency, as traceability, as technological neutrality, that have always been a part of Ancetral's um, um, rules on electronic commerce, but that are even more meaningful nowadays on uh, in the digital economy. So I. I know that my time is limited, so I would just like to flag how important for us the work of UNCTAD in and the economic research that is available to us to make uh, to inform our member states in uh, of the uh, um, economic necessity of uh, establishing these uh, frameworks, this this infrastructure without which. Uh, the uh, um, access of uh, all countries and all um, economic actors to digital trade will not be possible. And also to highlight the uh, partnerships uh, that we have uh, benefited from as a being partner in this uh, uh, e-commerce, uh, e-trade for all. Uh, we have really greatly benefited from the insight and from uh, the uh, uh, needs that are expressed by the various speakers in this panel. I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I think thank you very much for being in the business of building trust on internet, internet transactions. Otherwise, you know, there will not be any digital economy. So thank you very much for working hard on, on setting up the legal and regulatory measures and the model laws in, in, in this area. So now I think, uh, we are moving because we heard about what the governments need to do, what the international partners need to do. We talk about the MSMEs and what they, how they need to be helped. Now, we are now walking to see how the consumers, what are the perspectives of the consumers in this emerging digital economy? So I'm going to uh, ask uh, Mr. Pradeep Mehta, the Secretary General Cuts, and also Ms. Helena Laura, Director General of the Consumer International, to weigh on the, how the consumers can help this move uh, and advocate for fairer and more inclusive digital economies. So let me start with you, Pradeep. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Shamika, it's so nice to be here in Geneva in person uh, rather than so for the last two years, we've been only doing virtual events, which have its own advantages, but there are more disadvantages as well. Uh, most important is networking, which is one of the very important uh, tools that we work in the civil society with in order to improve the fate of consumers. I, uh, we, on a regular basis, we produce research uh, papers on digital economy and competition and trade and investments. So, so I'm very happy to announce here our latest competition and regulation report, uh, which was published uh, very recently. And it will be available on the Untax e-commerce webpage uh, uh, <coughs> to be downloaded as well. Uh, this looks at, and while it is India specific, but the lessons in this are relevant for any country, including the developing countries in particular. 
Having said that, uh, before we, uh, I come from India as a country which has been in the digital space since a very long time, much before uh, Shamika and the uh, Sorbion and others started you know, wading in from UNCAD. <laughs> in terms of inclusive development, what is very important is as a consumer issue is the very large uh, network of both telephone booths and e-commerce and uh, e uh, e uh, digital economy booths in every village. Now, not that every consumer can go and own an instrument or something, but can go to the telephone booth and make a call wherever he or she wishes to make a call and get all the papers processed through this e-kiosks, which are already there. So we have a long experience in there, which can be shared with the others as well. And that is, I mean, when I say inclusive development, one is very critical importance is the ease of living. So that has advanced the ease of living very hugely. Uh, and all these booths are equipped uh, with alternate power systems. Let's not forget that power supply is often at a premium in many developing countries. Maybe the cities are better off, but the villages are quite uh, bad at times uh, because of such a problem. Now, these issues have been raised, so there is some very good learning that we need to develop from that. And fine, I mean, Ratnagar spoke about these seven issues. It's all very good. But the most important thing is the kind of inherent handicaps which exist in developing countries. How do you deal with them? I mean, they find they have, it's a good wish list to have that we should have good infrastructure. But to have good infrastructure, we require resources. And not only resources, but resource utilization in a sensible way with the least amount of corruption involved. I mean, more, all developing countries, a lot of money in infrastructure goes into pockets of politicians or contractors or somebody, all. And I can say that very, with great certainty. Uh, we work in many countries in the world. We have four offices, three offices in Africa, uh, another in Hanoi, and uh, five offices in India. <laughs> We've been working since uh, Ratnakar uh, and I will even set up the South Asia Watch on Trade, Economics, and Environment in the year 1994-95. Uh, with that, we have a very strong network. Now, the important thing is what I've said often in, uh, in <clears throat> Palais, and you know, we must understand what development means. There is no legal definition available for development. We are, okay, <clears throat> now if you look at the definition which has been evolved through the SDGs, leaving no one behind, it's a huge challenge. It's a daunting task. I don't know how we can achieve that. But having said that, in the context of the digital economy, how do we see that as a enabler? I gave you an example, a living example. M Pesa was spoken about uh, from Kenya, for example, by Yovan. Now, these are, uh, even in India, now you have a, a very good system of e electronic payments through telephones. Now, there are three or four competitors. Fortunately, we have a lot of competitors. It's not, and one hugely innovative thing which government of India has done, has done <clears throat> Shamika, and something to be noted about is to set up an open net development uh, network. As against, you see, we have a large number of players, domestic players in, in our e-commerce uh, face, uh, <clears throat> like Amazon, or Walmart, Tata's, Reliance, et cetera, et cetera, both foreign and small. Now, they are dominant uh, players in the market. And when we talk in terms of SMEs, SMEs are the most vulnerable to date against any of these dominant players. And what government of India has done is probably first time in the world is a very innovative thing is to set up an open network that any seller or buyer can go there and you know, transact. This is something which uh, can be seen as to how it evolves. It has just been set up about six months ago, but it is very promising. Uh, and therefore it's very important to have in parallel to open, uh, <coughs> to counter any kind of, now, <clears throat> I spoke about resource utilization, resource generation, again, it's a problem. Another important issue that we see in developing countries often is the policy effectiveness. Policy effectiveness is very low. Policies are formulated, I mean, as I said, we've been working on many things, as you once said, boundary spanners. We are, we've been working as boundary spanners for a long time across various regimes, across various ministries, 
in various countries. And we know as to what happens when we see the kind of turf issues between one ministry and the other. Something which has been advocated since long that we are also looking at whole of government approach, uh, <coughs> no silos. The problem is often uh, that not the work to do is the tunnel vision. There is a tunnel vision approach also. <laughs> How do you deal with that? It's not a question of silos, they're blinkered approaches all at times. I mean, I can give you narrative personal experiences of how these blinkered approaches have actually gone against any kind of progress in this country. And the same factors will apply when we look at... Uh... Now, generally, countries put emphasis on growth uh, rather than, uh, you know, leaving the essential aspects of equity to the trickle-down process. Now, often the trickle-down process doesn't work. And <clears throat> both in terms of opportunity or even equality. Uh, what we've been seeing now is not only increasing inequality between and among countries, but even between and among sections in societies in various countries. Rich are getting richer. There is a K-shaped recovery taking place in many countries. At least I know in India, there's a K-shaped recovery. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And the same people, I, of course, they do get the benefit of the digital economy to a large extent in the sense that when they have to access very essential goods, or essential services like passport or birth certificate and so on and so forth. There are myriad things that you require in order to live as a citizen, in order to comply with government requirements. Uh, now, the, let me conclude here that we have the issue of, which has also been raised, we, this is something which is happening at the policy level. Uh, let me get back to the policy level. Is the kind of regulation of data. We are struggling ourselves. Within India itself, e-commerce is being played between the Department of Industry and the Department of Consumer Affairs. And we don't know where we will end, land up. I mean, they often, they work and cross over. And we also then have the Competition Commission of India, which is again a kind of a regulator to deal with this. Now, the other tendency which is increasing happening in India and many other countries, uh, Europe again, for example, is data localization. How can we do that? I mean, that would be very unfair uh, on consumers in the sense that you know you restrict them from being accessible or being or access things outside their own. Uh, if you are looking at e-commerce, then there the you know the whole world is uh, one single unit. You could you know, uh, <coughs> buy from Japan and send it to Kenya, wherever, and pay from India, wherever. See, it's, it's that kind of you know, smoothness which is available. And there, you also have other more finer details in terms of digital uh, commerce, which are quite often acting as handicaps to uh, smooth trade. Mm -hmm. Now, the Issue, as I said, the debate that is happening uh, globally is on issue about data and network effect while determining the market power of market dominance, for example. And that is something what we have to uh, think about. Secondly, to determine the relevant market uh, remedy narrowly in order to increase the probability of a firm being a dominant firm. Thirdly, a deeper scrutiny of mergers and acquisitions and adding deal value as a parameter to determine the threshold for mandatory merger reviews. Now, these are important things which uh, uh, another section of uh, the farmer competition branch is looking at very closely and will be discussed. But I thought it was important that this is where we need to also break the silos within UNCTAD. <laughs> No, I, every organization suffers from this uh, kind of uh, kind of this disease because it's a human disease and human behavior is very peculiar. So this is mine. <laughs> thank so, you. Uh, with that, uh, uh, let me uh, thank you once again. I could go on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Pradeep, and also you know bringing some examples. Huh? the Open Development Network of India. I think maybe when it is, you know, you've said that it is only six months old, maybe uh, after a little while, we probably should analyze and do a case study. So that would be good, Pradeep. So I'm asking you to do that on behalf of E-Trade for partnership, because I think we need, to, we need to learn these lessons. I think it's an extremely important initiative. And also thank you for talking about turf. Anyway, I think this is the human nature. I guess we have to 
have our own little boundaries and feel safe in those boundaries. I think it comes from, I don't know, the cave age, I don't know, so. you know, <laughs> when we were just coming out of trees, uh, but that's the nature. But I also want to say that there is no turf between the competition policy <laughs> unit no. and my division. And that, I think uh, no, Pam I knows that. that. <laughs> and Pam is, uh, knows that and she's nodding her head vigorously here. <laughs> so let me now move to Helena. Helena, the Director General of the Consumers International. So please share your views on the consumer perspective that we don't really hear and it's very important. Uh, Shamika, thank you to, to Anktad. I'm going to thank also the translators because by this point um, they've been working exceptionally hard and let's face it, so many uh, events at the moment highlight the importance of clear and quality communication despite all of the digital trends. Um, so Consumers International represents 200 consumer NGOs around the world uh, in 100 countries. And uh, so I speak here in Geneva, trying to at least synthesize some of the key points that they would have at the moment. Um, many of them have statutory connections into government, which tries to create a, a bridge. Um, and what's been noticeable to me, I had the fortune of joining the organization in 2019, which is fantastic timing. Um, but through all of the uh, very difficult times, um, one thing that has been commented on is the sense of continued collaboration and focus on the essential needs of consumers which are held here at UNCTAD and which are so essential. And because I don't think they get enough visibility and because most people don't know them to be able to exercise um, those what are essentially rights, um, I think it's important to, to flag again, those are not just access, inclusion, safety, your, your economic interests, they are also redress, representation, information, um, the right to sustainable consumption patterns, to privacy, and to the fact that online should be as safe as offline markets. Um, now, if you want to build a digital marketplace, if you want to build a sustainable marketplace, you need to include consumers. And there are so many reminders of why that is important and we don't do it enough. Um, most recently, of course, the IPCC report for the first time, chapter five in working group three's report looked at demand. That's us, that's what we eat, how we buy, how we travel, how we plug in, how we cool and heat our homes, how we travel. Um, they pointed to 40 to 70% of the energy transition or the transition uh, relying on our actions in the marketplace. The IEA in their report looking at how we get to the energy transition for 2050, 55% uh, of that transition is dependent on uh, active consumer involvement, like buying an electric vehicle, very relevant for today's news. Um, and another 8% is, do we choose to go and fly by plane, right? As opposed to another way of flying, of course. Um, should have said that but you know we look at this exactly if only um we look at uh you know the digital marketplace today uh report came out on product safety thousands of report of report notifications of unsafe products that's just within europe we don't measure it more broadly more recently we looked at digital finance the risks for consumers are growing faster than uh, people's inclusion in digital finance, according to um, uh, the World Bank. And so, you know, we are not necessarily building those bridges or connecting the dots to allow the voice of consumers into how we build those marketplaces. And we have to build that trust or we won't get there. Now, uh, we made a stab at measuring this because there is so much that is not measured and we haven't released the results fully because it's still in pilot mode, but our estimate is there's a sort of, we're, we're about 50% out of 100, 50% 50, 50 in delivering on those needs according to you know, the public measures that are out there that exist if things are measured and the opinions of uh, consumer experts. And, you know, there's no point saying that without pointing to, well, how do, we, how do we build? How do we build better? There is clearly no single pathway. 
Um, that's why we need so much more of the, the conversation um, at different levels. But the things that really stood out were number one, information to consumers. This has been pointed out by the G20, rightly so. The level of information about the changes we're going through and the level of reliable information uh, it is, you know, it, it's incredibly poor. Look at um, the extent to which I spend noted that 40% of online claims uh, for uh, green products were misleading recently. Um, vulnerability, the way in which we build in safeguards, take buy now, pay later. It used to be something that was sort of a fringe. It is now global. Uh, it is being used by consumers for their essential needs and consumers are getting into debt to pay things off. Um, limited levels of safeguard there and um, we recently proposed a couple of changes that, that could be made. Redress, the extent to which e-commerce is growing across borders but the lack of redress mechanisms. Enforcement, brilliant book came out recently by Hans Micklitz, um, who's one of the leading lights. Uh, very long book on enforcement, basically pointing out that we are not measuring it sufficiently um, and we are not enforcing. And the level of international collaboration that needs to happen on these to build trust um, has long been a, a point for consumer advocates everywhere. I think there are some other places where we can build and connect the, dot, the dots and build bridges. One um, is actually looking at how we connect locally. Uh, different topic, but we've just uh, managed to secure funding to support local support consumer advocates in low and middle income countries to talk and have a robust communication with um, their local government so that we can bring the consumer voice into decision making into policy making um, and help shape. Um, and that is not something that sits in Geneva, it is really making sure that that, is, that, that capacity is built. Um, where it counts. I think there is another place where we can connect the dots and that is between, for example, consumers and farmers. Let's find the ways in which the value chains can be built differently, um, where you know, I'm not saying that everything needs to be arrest centered on the consumer or centered on one group. This is about building between and imagining what our value chains, what our marketplace can look like if we really take into account in that case, uh, the needs and rights of, of, um, uh, uh, of smallholder farmers and of vulnerable consumers. I do think there is an opportunity um, to relook at consumer policy in 2025. Um, I think that will be a, a, an amazing challenge for UNCTAD uh, it, to bring that up to speed and to be the leading force uh, for the change that we need to see in our economy. And I do support and all of the efforts to link consumer policy and competition policy as we change our marketplace for and with people. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak here. Um, this is uh, a place where we don't, we must not leave anyone behind and we all need to be involved. Um, and we are proud and pleased to be part of the effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena, and putting very powerfully the, the need for active cons consumer engagement. I'm, I'm totally with you. I mean, when I'm buying online, this is my concern too, uh, as a consumer, the risk that we face. And it, there is a lot to, be near, lot to be done in that area. And then we are very happy to have you uh, to you know, spearhead this moment within the uh, our partnership. So I, we are now going to the last speaker and this is about resource gaps. So this is another elephant in the room. You know how it is, it's the SMEs and it's the women and youth led enterprises, it's the startups and it is in the digital sphere. And you go walk into a bank and the bank is not even looking at you. So that's the situation with the digital entrepreneurs. So we have now Mr. Hani Salem Sonbor, he's the chief executive officer of the International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation to tell us to what extent are enough resources available and used to narrow these digital gaps in developing countries, and especially when it comes to financing uh, startups. Uh, Mr. Sombol, you have the floor, and I think you also have the last word because this is the elephant in the room. Is it good to have the last word, I guess? No? Huh. Okay. I really thank you very much, uh, everyone, really for, uh, uh, really having 
me with you on this very important day, uh, discussing a very important topic. And I would like to uh, say that we feel very, also very proud and uh, that we were part actually of making- The interpretation now comes to an end, thank you. To participate in the making of, uh, of the Eat Rate for All initiative that was back in uh, 2016. We believed at that time that we could provide through this very important initiative, you know, the uh, uh, new approach uh, to trade development through electronic exchanges. And also today we see that E-Trade for All uh, offers really institutions an additional occasion to produce meaningful and concrete results uh, to advance trade and improve, uh, improve lives. Uh, the focus actually here uh, will be on how digital technologies make international trade more efficient by reducing time of the challenges and responsibilities for trade financing gap. The uh, first concern of lack of financing for SMEs uh, in developing uh, countries, uh, these businesses are most affected actually by the uh, trade finance gap as they tend to have higher rejections rates compared to a larger larger firms. The reason is that the absence of a collateral or a credit history or lack of capacity and, uh, and also the, uh, the difficulty of really interacting with uh, banks who prefer usually larger customers. Uh, and that was all, all, also, we add to all of this, actually this uh, inability to access, uh, uh, you know, the internet and uh, use digital solutions. That's add to the whole challenges. I was very uh, surprised to see that most of, more than 50% of the SMEs do have problems accessing this kind of uh, the, the internet. The second challenge lies actually in the significant number of trade finance transactions that still rely on paper-based uh, documentation, uh, which cause actually delay in the process. Uh, also, there are many human errors, lack of trust and so on. And definitely this will have an implication at the end of the day on the cost of doing trade. Financial technologies firms make use of internet access uh, such as blockchains and uh, others to improve access to information with fewer security concerns. They provide solutions by provide, providing non-bank credit, credit information and help draw also uh, more small and medium sized enterprises into the global trade. At ITFC, we believed long time ago, even before COVID-19, that without having really uh, digital solutions, we will not be able to be relevant in the future. As dear Pamela, Pamela said that the future of trade is purely digital. We believe so, and we think that we should really be prepared for really having this uh, as part of the way or the way we do business in the future. And we also embarked in digital trade journey uh, for long, longer before COVID-19. And we also tested our infrastructure during the COVID-19. And, uh, uh, and we, we really felt that we have uh, really passed the test with having no mistakes actually doing trade for all uh, uh, during this very difficult time. Also, we have adopted electronic bills of ladings and other e-documentations. E uh, to enhance the process of efficiency by also reducing paperwork. And we uh, wanted really to be more uh, inclusive and supportive to member countries. We extend advisory services to member countries to be able to do trade on platforms and to be able to do trade digitally. And we have really a number of good, good uh, lessons and good uh, successful stories. As just last April, uh, we, we supported Burkina Faso, for example, uh, export of cotton to the international market, uh, thanks to the electronic bill, uh, the e-bill, uh, issued on digital trade finance platform, which is called Polerio, most of you know it. We succeeded in shortening the transactions time by almost 75%. And it took almost five days instead of 20 days to complete the whole process. Digital technologies helps improve efficiency and substantially reduce, as I said, cost. So at the end, we cannot really avoid really being part of this. And uh, however, we need to work on the gaps. Development banks and, and their partners, uh, most of them are, you know, some of them are present uh, today in our meeting. 
will should should continue actually to uh, really provide technical support and capacity building to at least the least member countries, and also to to, to contribute to the technical and financial resources to support digital technologies for SMEs and the development of trade. And that is really what is really needed. For instance, we should really continue to do and support e-commerce, national strategies, development and implementation. We worked with UNCTAD on also assessing the gaps for really uh, uh, the technological gap in, in member countries. And it was very successful really uh, uh, projects. Finally, ITFC digital uh, you know, bootcamp uh, program in Cameroon uh, is also another success stories. Uh, in partnership actually with, with the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat, which we uh, try to help and support digitization of women and SMEs. Uh, and really, it really offers a huge potential for women entrepreneurs to expand their markets uh, reach and also be able to uh, do trade with others digitally, I mean here. This is of course many, uh, one example of many, many examples that, that, uh, that uh, ITFC is really pursuing. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I do believe uh, tomorrow's e-trade uh, is, uh, is actually going to be the future and no trade. And uh, we should really cooperate all together really to achieve this uh, very important target. I stop here for the time and I thank you all again for your kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sombo. And uh, thank you very much uh, for being a very strong partner in the E-Trade for All uh, partnership. And for IT, I, I also want to thank ITFC for recognizing very early on that the future is digital. And I think this is an extremely important point for all other financing institutions. So now we are coming to the end of our session. So can I, could I please ask everybody to give a big hand to our, our panel, the excellent panel. I think we need to... Thank you so much and have a very good day. Thank you.